Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Ashish Darvari from Axiom Eyes. We're going to talk today about why formal verification is becoming so important. Ashish, formal has been around for a long time. Why is it suddenly so important? Oh, formal has had a checkered history in terms of gaining momentum, although most of the interesting work in formal kicked off in late 90s, early 2000s after the events in 1995 when a certain processor could not execute an arithmetic instruction properly. And what happened then is the appreciation for formulas started to grow, but the tool capacities were becoming a big limitation. And because formal guys like to prove everything exhaustively and they want the state space exploration has to be complete, and because the state space is growing exponentially because of the design complexity increasing exponentially, tools are always having to play a catch up which means that the early adopters of formal lost interest. Oh, we're trying formal, but it's not working. We're trying to say we're going to prove it, but it can't prove. What has happened in the last 10 to 12 years is significant for us to understand. The technology underpinning the formal verification tools has improved dramatically. The methodology of deploying formal and the understanding of that methodology has improved dramatically. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Ashish, what are we looking at? So we're looking at the verification challenges from an SOC point of view, regardless of which domain these SOCs come from. So at the highest level, most of the IP components, whether you know we have an ARM chip or an x86 processor or a RISC-V processor, we all have an architecture for that. And with the architecture comes the requirements to validate that the microarchitecture implementation has implemented the architecture faithfully. Now, in the case of GPUs, and also in the case of more complex fabrics that connect all these IP components, architecture has a role to play, although the architecture may not be as uh, formalized as maybe a CPU architecture is. So there's, there's not always necessary an instruction set architecture for everything, but there is always an architectural spec that designers are implementing in the microarchitecture. So if you look at it from the point of view of what a modern day SOC wants to have, what they need to have is performance. They want to have low power footprint. There's also the area. We need to save area as much as we can. You know, as the node sizes are shrinking, we want the PPA to be balanced. This is what a new design architect would be thinking of when you're bringing up a new chip. Does it get more complicated as we get into uh, decomposing these chips into multiple chiplets and uh, putting them into a package? Yeah, great idea. So great question. So, chiplets is basically you're distributing the one SOC structure into lots of small chips and you can stack them all, 3D or 2D. Now, how are you going to connect these chips? They're going to connect them with UCIE or some other protocol. So at the end of the day, now you're talking about chip to chip communication. The fundamentals of verification challenges have not changed, Ed. This is what I wanted to say. So all of these things that you see here, security, safety, which are the new verification challenges in the last 10 years, they've gained prominence. But if you look at microarchitecture verification, which is usually called functional verification in DV, it has remained a constant throughout. It's becoming harder to sign off chips without functional bugs. So that alone itself is an issue. But with chiplets, as you said, it's going to get harder now because the time to market is not increasing either, right? So it's shrinking. Has the writing of assertions gotten any easier? That was always one of the big uh, drawbacks to formal, right? Is people just didn't think in terms of assertions. Absolutely, absolutely. So what you see is what you get is, the, is this theme with formal. So you write a bad assertion, everything from that point onwards goes down. And what has happened is traditionally system very log assertions uh, were used and developed you know, back in the days when Accelera was standardizing for simulation test benches. So for formal, the assertions look different in the way that we try to keep them simple. So if you can ask these questions in a way that the tool can yield convergence faster, then your likelihood of obtaining a conclusive result is much better. So we can find deadlocks, we can find power issues, ex-propagation issues, security issues and safety issues, all of them much more efficiently with formal. You've got a lot of, of moving parts here though. You've got AI, you've got lots of different chiplets that we we're talking about before. 
Uh, you've got very co complex and much tighter uh, integration between the hardware and the software. Does it get harder to now trace all these things and say, here's where you can go wrong? Yes, so AI chips are quite interesting, Ed, because in AI chips what we've got is a lot of parallel computation because of the neural network type processing going on. And you've got caches that don't have single ports, you've got multiple uh, reads and writes happening to the same cache line, so you can imagine that would be a cause for the deadlock. And the thing that's making AI chips faster is high performance interconnect. I mean, talking about high performance interconnect using any of the modern protocols like Qi or CXL, as soon as you bring them in, you've got so much action going on with multiple bus contention, multiple cache line contention. All of this is a reason for things to deadlock even more. So as much as we like to get to the uh, tape out silicon stage sooner, and there's a lot of competition with a lot of AI chip vendors, this problem is becoming more and more prominent. And I think people are seeing this because at the end of the day, the silicon has got to work, not just first time, but all the time. And it won't because you just need one pattern of software interaction. Because imagine trying to train your chip on billions and billions of data sets. How do we know that one of these data sets is not gonna trigger an interaction at the semiconductor level, causing this thing to manifest? So we can't leave this to chance. And this becomes harder too, because these, these algorithms are being written all the, rewritten all the time too, Absolutely. right, and updated. Absolutely, a very good point, Ed, yeah. And because all of these um, models that they're getting trained on, the LLM models, they're all coming from all sorts of directions. And, uh, and this is the thing we have to understand. So if you are an OEM building hardware and software both, uh, I could imagine, uh, let's say Apple, for, for example, they make their own chip and they make their own uh, Mac OS. It's a lot easier for them to contain any of the artifacts of you know, things falling out. But when your chip is going to run hundreds of different kinds of softwares developed in any part of the world, this is now a much harder problem to solve, you know, and, and the risks are much higher. So uh, this is why I think it's important for those chip design companies who don't build their own entire software stack, firmware stack, to pay attention to this kind of challenges even more. One of the places that we're really seeing a lot of uptake in formal is in places like automotive and anything that is safety critical, mission critical type of areas. How does formal play in there? Yeah, it's a great question. So safety is an interesting one because safety verification has to not just work in terms of reliability, but also liability. So it has to conform with ISO 26262 requirements. And one of the most important things that an automotive car needs to have is redundancy, triple modular or double modular or as many as you like, because we cannot accept faults to bring down things. So when you bring things in modular fashion, you need fault tolerance, so therefore you need them to run in lockstep mode. And when you're running a processor in a lockstep mode, you want it to behave in the same way every clock cycle, which means there are two copies of the processor running the same software, every single cycle behaving in the same way. Now, interesting things happen. Because we are all designing low power chips, we use a lot of X's in the designs. Designers love X's because they don't need to initialize all the caches, all the memories, so which is the X propagation verification problem, and designers do a good job at that. But imagine if there is an X that has been left undetected and makes its way to the output pin, then the X can be a zero in one processor and one in the other one, causing a mismatch. That is going to affect your safety lockstep verification problem. However, this is only one of the parts of the safety verification, which is the systematic verification. You've also got to study what is called fault propagation, fault detection, fault injection. So there's a whole lot of analysis that needs to be carried out to ensure that there is no, it's not possible at all that there would be a bad event that causes a catastrophic failure in the hardware leading to a car's uh, full failure. So that's where functional safety is becoming a big nightmare. Where formal shines really is being able to prove these artifacts for sure. That's where the strength of this is. You also have a lot of things that you have to prove. Can you do this all in parallel now? One of the problems with formal in the past has been, it's been pretty slow. You're basically doing one thing and tracing it. That isn't a problem anymore. So the way the EDA tools are now structured is that you could run as many proofs as you like in parallel with the caveat that you need enough licenses uh, and you have to have enough uh, compute servers with enough processors running on these servers. 
but we could farm out regressions with, I don't know, 100,000 properties um, and get a good convergence done um, in about three to four days, depending on the complexity of the chip. I, I'm just trying to remember our risk 5 work where we had 30,000 properties on a CV32 E40B core, and I was verifying that with Jasper Gord using our Formalize app, and I think the run times were more like two and a half hours to get past 80% of the property set. And the last 20% takes a lot longer, but let's say in a couple of days, you're done with everything. On, on larger designs with hundreds of thousands of, of properties, we are seeing between half a week to a week, again, depending on the complexity. But sequential uh, uh, proofs is not the main issue here. Those, those, are, those are infrastructure challenges that we have long overcome. So. How about when the algorithms are updated or the software is updated and ECOs, things like that? Yeah, so you know, now you're going in the land of post-silicon uh, versus pre-silicon. So all of the stuff I've been talking about was largely in the realms of pre-silicon. So we do come across case studies with our customers where we were not involved in the verification, but they have had uh, instances uh, where some of the bug has leaked into the silicon. Um, somebody in the firmware of the software land has discovered a scenario where the chip is not working correctly. And now the randomness of dynamic simulation doesn't help here because now you've got to find that random seed that is going to be able to allow you to find this defect again, to be able to reproduce it in dynamic simulation. So until you can see this in simulation, designers can't fix it. And even if they've fixed it, you don't know how to validate it. So this is where formal really, really comes handy. What this does require, it doesn't come for free. It does require a careful understanding of the environment in which the processor was running at the time of failure. What was the software stack looking like? Were the drivers there? So where formal shines here is we would be able to constrain the formal environment with the right setup based on the uh, feedback that we've got from the field. And then we can constrain the environment. So this is not exhaustive proofs under all stimulus, but this is constrained verification under a specific environment to reproduce the bug and then fix it. This is where I am seeing a lot of traction with formal. And it's, it's only because these, these IPs or chips haven't been previously verified by formal. So yeah, this is a great um, strength. You've got a lot of issues here that you've you've highlighted. So you've got performance, you've got security, and there's also trade-offs in all this stuff That's as right. well, right? That's right. So, you know, in the beginning I said power performance in area and PPA is a big challenge. Um, where performance modeling is done using C++ or virtual prototyping, they're basically getting insights about what is the performance likely to be. But at the end of the day, the silicon has to meet that performance. And that's where verification validation comes into the picture. Most design houses do not think that formal verification is ready for performance verification. And we are seeing more and more of these examples where our customers are saying, hang on a second, we've done all of the functional verification stuff, can you not help with performance? And if you cut the long story short and, and take a high level view of performance verification, what exactly are we talking about? We're talking about making sure that certain things are completed within certain bounds. And what do people use typically? Counters. So we are now having to verify designs with lots of performance counters. And this is the sweet spot for formal. I know people would say, oh, counters are bad for formal. But actually, no, formal would be great for counter verification. We would be able to establish that under given scenarios. So we again could do this without any firmware or software, or we could do this with firmware software. It is a formal is about possibilities, I like to believe. And we could run this performance verification thing as a separate verification target and exhaustively prove that those properties hold. Because you really do not want to be running dynamic sims on counters that are 64-bit. Uh, 18 and a half quintillion uh, is the maximum value of the counter. We picked up designs where counters rolled off half a point during emulation and the bug was a really corner case bug that we could catch within seconds running a formal assertion check. So that's that's where formal really shines in performance side. And what you've really said here is, is that you, with formal you can constrain the problem 
but with all the resources that you have now, you can constrain a much bigger problem and more complex problem. That's correct. So because we have the power of assumed properties and we have multiple configurations of the design, we could play with configurations, we could uh, control the ingress, we can control the uh, scenarios that we have to be overlap with each other. Most of the time doing formal, I suppose, should be the same with simulation, is spent in thinking about what we need to do. The hows are easier. It's, a, it's knowing what we need to verify is the hardest part in all of this. Ashish Darbari, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.